this episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation on mental health and the elderly, 12 key points. Now, in the past with Counselor Toolbox podcast and the webinars, we have done presentations on dementia and other I issues with working with older adults. So we're not, or I hope we're not really going to rehash the same stuff today. Um, we're really going to build on that and focus on some of the unique issues that may be facing um, people who are over the age of 55 and up, I know typically we say 65, but people who are in that 55 range sometimes um, meet these criteria too. We'll review the 12 key issues that either differ or often go overlooked in people over 65. The first one that we want to talk about is the fact that there are multiple psychosocial aspects to aging. When people get to be in their older years. Um, as Erickson would have said, they go through the developmental crisis of integrity versus despair. They're looking back over their life and going, did this mean something? Did I do what I intended to do? Was it an active life or did I just kind of skate through? And they may have to deal with some things that, you know, they wished they would have done. And grieve the losses that they may not be able to um, recover from at this point by the time you're you know when you're 70 not to say that 70 year olds haven't gone bungee jumping or skydiving but most 70 year olds are not going to do that so they may be looking back going ah, i thought i wanted to do that and it would have been great but yeah no i missed that window and they may Skydiving, probably not something that's going to be grief-inducing, but there are other things that may be grief-inducing that they need to process. So helping people find meaning in their life and come to a sense of acceptance and pride for what they did accomplish. As we age, we all, for the most part, lose a certain amount of physical functioning. It doesn't mean we're necessarily in a wheelchair or a walker or can't get out of bed, but we slow down. You know, our joints start telling us that you need to warm up before you go on a run. Um, you can't bend over as much. It takes a little bit more effort to keep up with the grandkids, and that's okay. But for some people, especially if they're losing things like sight and hearing, they may experience again some grief some frustration my grandfather i've talked about him a bunch of times and his parkinson's disease um, he his entire life was doing manual labor and he was a painter and then as he got older he started making miniature dollhouse furniture which was beautiful but it required a lot of fine movements and as his Parkinson's disease took over, he wasn't able to do that anymore. And as he got older, he also lost visual abilities. So reading became even more difficult. And there were a lot of things that he used to like to do that gradually started being whittled away that he couldn't do anymore. And he started to experience a lot of depression because he wasn't finding anything to replace it. And that's a real challenge with this population, is helping them make sure that they can engage in some sort of meaningful activity every day. If they used to love to garden, you know, getting down on your hands and knees may not be what you can do anymore, but there are raised garden beds. If they like to do, you know, whatever they like to do, see if there's a way that you can make some accommodations to help them do it or maybe help them mentor somebody and, and teach them how to do it so they're not actually having to do the hands-on. Whatever it is that helps give them a sense of accomplishment. Death of friends is something else that they experience. My stepfather is in his upper 80s now, and he was in journalism his entire life. As journalists and anchors from 
you know, when I was younger, have started to pass on. I, he knew all of them because he was involved in that in that scene and in that system. And it became um, frustrating for him because he felt like he was the last one left. Obviously, death is something people are going to have to grieve. But as we get older and more and more of our significant others and our friends pass on, our own mortality becomes an issue that we need to face. There's also changes in social relationships as an adjustment to aging. And we're going to talk about retirement blues in a little while. But as people get older, they may not do the same things. They may not go hiking together. Um, their social relationships or, or hunting or whatever it is, uh, their social relationships may take a different turn in, ter in terms of activities that they do, who they hang out with, and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Once people retire, for example, they are not socializing with those people they used to see day in and day out for 20 years. However, they may find new friends or new activities, new social relationships that they're doing during the day while all those other poor people are at work. Helping people focus on what they do have and what they want. Identify, you know, you're missing having this connection. Is it missing having the connection with those particular people or missing having something to do during the day? And if it's something to do during the day, then let's figure out what that might be. Frequent mental distress may interfere with major life activities such as eating well, maintaining a household, working, or su sustaining personal relationships. Older adults with frequent mental distress are more likely to, to engage in behaviors that can contribute to poor health, such as smoking, not getting recommended amounts of exercise, or eating a diet with fruit, few fruits and vegetables. We, and this is true for anybody. When people experience mental distress, we tend to not take as good care of ourselves. We have lower energy. We have fatigue. We have apathy, low motivation, yada, yada. We're not thinking let's go to the gym or let's do this or that or the other thing. With people who ex are experiencing frequent mental distress for whatever reason, maybe they have a lot of friends that are suddenly passing on or a lot of life changes, it's important that we preventatively intervene and make sure that they are using healthy coping skills and effective distress tolerance and still physically taking care of themselves. One thing to remember is that mood issues are not a consequence of normal aging. People don't just, quote, naturally get depressed or naturally develop dementia. It's important to remember that depression and anxiety and dementia and all those things do have some other root causes that we want to look at. When we talk about depression, you can have situational depression like you have with just about anybody where they're grieving losses, they're experiencing life transitions, maybe their kids just moved away or anything that would normally cause somebody depression can cause an older person depression. So. Okay, we talked about some of those on the last slide. There's also vascular depression, and this is more specific to the older population. There's a bi-directional association between depression and cardiovascular disease. If somebody has cardiovascular disease, they have a greater chance of developing depression. If they have a depression, they have a greater chance of developing cardiovascular disease. When they are having difficulty oxygenating, they have found that there's a strong correlation between that and depressive symptoms, fatigue, loss of energy, apathy, that we want to pay attention to. Elderly men, and from a clinician's standpoint, this is important to know, elderly men have the highest rate of suicide of any group out there. We want to pay attention to this. Yes, they may be going through things. My stepfather, you know, is still grieving the loss of my mother and it's important to know what's going on and regularly check in with him to make sure that he's 
doing okay. I, I don't want to say he's happy, but make sure that he's doing okay and really screen for that, um, that suicide. When untreated, depression reduces life expectancy, worsens medical illnesses, enhances healthcare costs, and is the primary cause of suicide among older people. It's not generally health conditions, which you might think that, you know, some sort of health condition like cancer or heart disease might be the primary cause of suicide. It's not. It's depression. We need to pay attention and to, to signs of depression. Both exercise and dietary interventions can promote mental health. We keep the cardiovascular system healthy. We're going to stave off one of those risk factors for depression. Dietary intervention, interventions, especially diets higher in omega-3s, they found, are also helpful at maintaining higher levels of cognitive functioning and preventing or at least mitigating depression. So really important that people eat. And think about a lot of elderly folks. They are living by themselves or maybe, you know, with their significant other, but they may not be able to get to the store regularly to get food. And this is why we have programs like Meals on Wheels. But it's so important to make sure that what food they do have is healthy and nutritious so we can mitigate a, another one of those risk factors for depression and potentially suicide. Almost half of older adults who are diagnosed with major depression also meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder. If you're working with an older adult who is evidencing signs of depression, then you want to screen for co-occurring anxiety. There's a lot to be anxious about. They, can, they may be anxious about their mortality. They may be anxious about paying bills. Uh, when my grandfather passed away, my grandmother's anxiety went through the roof because he had always taken care of the bills. He had always taken care of the finances. Now, and, you know, if something went wrong with the house, he took care of it. Once he passed on, his anxiety went through the roof. Same thing for my stepfather. When, right after my mother passed, he just kept lamenting about the fact that he didn't realize how much stuff she took care of, and he just felt completely overwhelmed. We do want to look for that anxiety. It may be situationally based anxiety, but it's still there and it's still exhausting and it's still keeping the cortisol levels and HPA axis revved up, which is going to prevent adequate sleep and worsen health conditions and yada, yada, yada. Really important. When we see people with high anxiety, especially older adults, it's not uncommon to also see hypertension, which again is going to contribute to uh, more negative health outcomes. Good screening and regular assessment. If you're working with an older adult, you know, just like with anybody, hopefully, but especially if you're working with this population, you want to regularly screen and do mi mini mental status exams, screening for depression and anxiety and suicidality. Cognitive decline, as we've talked about in the other classes, is often partly preventable. Slowing or some loss of other cognitive functions takes place most notably in information processing, selective attention, and problem-solving ability. It doesn't mean they can't understand stuff. It doesn't mean that they can't pay attention or solve problems. It just means they're a little slower at it. You know, it, it's important to give people who are older a little bit of time. They may, may need to take it in and think about it for a second, and then they're able to get on, on board. We don't want to take a paternalistic approach to working with the elderly and assume that they can't process the information or they're not doing it fast enough, so we'll just do it for them. We want to empower them to do as much as they can on their own. Prevention and early intervention, when we're talking about just general old cognitive decline, we're not necessarily talking about dementia here, we want to focus on encouraging different problem-solving tasks on a regular basis. You don't want people sitting in front of the TV watching their stories day in and day out, and that's all they do. 
you want to have them engaging in other things. If they want to watch their stories, you know, that's fine. Maybe they also work on crocheting or painting or putting together puzzles or any sort of problem-solving task that can also keep their mind you know, active. Encourage them to maintain physical activity to improve blood flow, which also improves oxygenation to the brain. Keep those brain tissues healthy. Encourage them to maintain a good sleep routine, which also means addressing bladder issues. There are a lot of reasons, we're going to talk later about sleep, but there are a lot of reasons that older people have difficulty sleeping. Again, their, their sleep needs actually don't go down as they age. So people who say, well, as, as I get older, I only need three or four hours of sleep. Research has shown that that's really not true. You may be able to get by on that, but in order to keep the body as healthy as possible, um, older adults still need eight to nine hours of sleep. Dementia is something that some people develop, and it's different than normal aging. There is some, slow, some cognitive and physical slowing in normal aging. Dementia is on the other end of the spectrum. It's much more intense, much more problematic in multiple areas of life. Risk factors for dementia include smoking, alcohol use, and hypertension. All of these things affect the cardiovascular system and can contribute to the development of dementia, um, especially vascular dementia, which is sometimes a side effect of mini strokes or regular strokes. Diabetes is a risk factor for dementia, especially if someone is having frequent um, episodes of severe hypoglycemia. They found a direct correlation between the frequency of hypoglycemic episodes and the onset of dementia. And traumatic brain, brain injury from falls. Dementia can be caused by um, some traumatic brain injury. A lot of people, as they get older, have a little bit more difficulty with balance normally. But then you add on any other problems like changes in vision or medications they may be taking that can contribute to additional problems with balance. And so people in this population are at a higher risk of falling and, and injury. So what do we do about it? Physical activity. Again, I sound like a broken record. Physical activity helps people maintain their muscle tone, which helps them maintain their balance a little bit better. It also reduces cardiovascular risk factors and can help mitigate diabetes. They need to control their blood pressure and their blood, blood sugar, not smoke. Engage in social activities. They found significant relationships between people who engaged in social activities and their lack of dementia, so to speak. They hypothesize that this is because people who are engaging with others tend to be less depressed and less stressed out, ergo, they don't have the other physiological factors that can contribute. You want to de uh, mitigate depression and prevent it when at all possible. People are going to have depressive episodes. That's just kind of one of those things that we know may happen. We do want to make sure they've got the coping skills to handle it, and we mitigate it as best as possible. There's a high correlation between depression, especially with melancholic features, and the onset of dementia. Chronic health conditions are another issue that is that are somewhat unique to this population. As people age, their body slows down. Well, their insides slow down a little bit too, and it's harder for the kidney and liver to clear out toxins, which includes medication. Certain medications can build up in a person's system more quickly than it did when they were younger, which can lead to toxic effects. Additionally, other medications may get into a person's system or raise their blood plasma levels of it more quickly than a younger person, which can contribute to side effects. And we know that the elderly population is more vulnerable to side effects from 
any medication they take. Pain is another issue with a lot of chronic health conditions, and this kind of dovetails right off of medication because people who are in pain, if they're prescribed pain meds, uh, may likely, will likely, have some side effects from those pain meds. So we need to mitigate their injury risk. Uh, all of these things sort of work into one another. Additionally, when people are not mobile, you know, they're sitting still because of some chronic health condition, they don't feel well, they don't have energy, that can contribute to increased pain. Reduced physical activity can also occur because of chronic health conditions. We keep saying that it's important for people to have physical activity. Now, I don't expect grandma to go out and run a 5K, but we want to see people getting up and moving around, walking the dog. Um, and even if that means having, you know, little rat dog, you don't necessarily want her walking a Rottweiler either. But... <laughs> Encouraging physical activity, which is why animal-assisted recreation is so useful with this population because a lot of people who are older love to see dogs, and they're more than happy to throw a ball. You know, that's something that they can do. Seated, as we talked about the other day, seated Tai Chi is another activity that people with mobility or balance issues can often do. It's important to figure out how to help them increase or maintain a moderate level of physical activity as best as they can in order to prevent the problems that are caused by a lack of physical activity. Chronic health conditions can impair sleep. If you are coughing all night long, if you're having to go pee every 10 minutes, it seems like, because your prostate's acting up, if you are having pain, which is keeping you from sleeping well, whatever the case may be, sleep impairment we know is correlated with the development of mood issues as well as impaired immune system and all kinds of other stuff. It's important that we pay attention to these chronic health conditions. So, social withdrawal. Well, if somebody's tired and in pain and having difficulty moving around because they're dizzy or whatever, they may not want to go out. They may withdraw socially. If they are having a chronic health condition, they may be frustrated about the fact that, you know, oh, I'm so t sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. And they may not want to get out of their room or leave their house, which is another significant risk factor for dementia, cognitive decline, and mental health issues. Chronic health conditions can also put strains on social supports. And I use the term social supports broadly. It can be the neighbor. It can be your kids. It can be whomever. But if somebody has a chronic health condition and they rely on social supports to assist them, whether it's, you know, mom needs to, needs to move in or I need to go by and check on mom every day or there's financial things that we need to do to help mom out. Any of that can pro cause strains on relationships and that's going to be important to work through because the older person doesn't want to feel like a burden. You know, we know this, but by the same token, they may have some needs that, you know, just they have to be met and they feel like they're kind of stuck between a rock and the hard place. The social supports may feel stuck or obligated or whatever re word you want to use to help this person out. So there may be some resentment that needs to be worked through. We do need to pay attention to this because even though the resentment may not be coming from our patient, it's directed toward our patient and or toward the situation, which is going to impact our patient. Medications for chronic health conditions can cause a variety of problems uh, because of their side effects and because of interactions. If somebody's on blood pressure medication and then they also start taking anxiety medication, that can interact and cause problems. Pain is another 
chronic condition that people experience and it can be idiopathic meaning it doesn't have any particular origin but they're you know they've got this back pain or they've got this other pain that is bothering them and we need to help them figure out what they can do whether that's referrals to you know referral to a doctor obviously and then they may also need referrals for massage therapy or hydrotherapy or physical therapy or something as we age we have an increased injury risk a lot of people have a super increased injury risk because they uh, have certain levels of uh, osteoporosis so their bones are weaker and it's easier for their bones to break but there's also as people get older um, if you look at your your grandfather or your great-grandfather or grandmother uh, our skin gets thinner which means we bruise easier and our skin tears easier and a lot of times it's harder for us to heal as we get older we need to pay attention to this and make sure that people are in as a safe environment as possible frailty syndrome is i put it under chronic health conditions because i didn't know where else to put it it's a geriatric syndrome characterized by the clinical presentation of identifiable physical alterations such as loss of muscle mass and strength energy exercise tolerance and decreased physiological reserve when you see an older person who you know suddenly seems to have wasted away is what a lot of us say in in lay terms that is probably frailty syndrome and we want to look at the reasons for this it could be a medical issue but it also usually relates to malnutrition lack of exercise and depression you want to look at what are the reasons for the malnutrition is the person you know having gastric upset are they not motivated to eat because they're so depressed do they not have access to food what's causing it is there a change in exercise habits because of pain because of depression you know what's causing it we want to get to the root cause in order to try to reduce um, or reverse the frailty syndrome horticulture therapy gardening they found shows great potential in enhancing mental health cognitive functioning and physical health in the elderly when you're trying to improve cognitive functioning you don't necessarily have to be solving algebra problems anything that gets people thinking and remembering and you know using their mind to to do something like okay there's this plant i want to plant so i need to um, get the plant i need to dig a hole i need to um, plant it down whatever you need to do but it keeps the person active age-related physiological physiological changes that occur with regard to medication tolerance drug effects can be altered due to a different rate of absorption um, in older people their gastric ph goes up and they may have a decreased absorptive absorptive surface so their their stomach may shrink a little bit distribution as we age our total body water tends to go down our lean body mass tends to go down which can affect the intensity of the medications or the distribution of the medication metabolism as i talked about earlier decreasing hepatic mass your liver mass decreases it also becomes less um, efficient and blood flow can affect medication levels and medication impacts in us you know if you're not moving much then that medication's not getting distributed throughout your body excretion decreasing renal blood flow so there's the kidneys that we talked about um, and other secretion problems with relating to kidneys can also let medication levels build up more than one would expect so in some cases there's less absorption than you would think because of the differences in gastric ph etc but in a lot of cases the levels of medication for older patients tends to be a lot lower because of these issues 
Some of the most common medicines likely to have adverse effects include anticoagulants, so the things that make your blood clot, antibiotics, I didn't know that one, diuretics, things that help you flush water, hypoglycemic agents, your diabetes medication, benzodiazepines, opioids, and NSAIDs. Um, now, these are the ones that, you know, we're going to see more often. Your benzos, like your Valium and your Xanax and those sorts of things, can build up really quickly. It's important to know if somebody is taking, even if they're taking it PRN, you know, they have a prescription for, for Xanax that they can take as needed. Okay. But if they're taking it and then suddenly exhibiting symptoms of cognitive decline, then they may need to have their dose adjusted or be put on a different medication. Opioids are kind of the same way. With older adults, a lot of times people just assume that, you know, once you hit a certain age, there's no sexuality anymore. There's no sexual interest. That is so not the case. Hormonal changes and other physiological changes associated with age, aging can affect sexual interest some. However, you know, if those hormones are balanced out, then people may still have a very healthy sexual appetite. We don't want to assume that just because somebody is older, they don't have sexual desire. Erectile dysfunction is a problem in men increasing with age. One of those things they can see a urologist about. It's not a mental health thing. Diabetes, cardiovascular, cancerous, and chronic respiratory diseases, and also some medications can reduce sexual capacity and desire. If somebody had a healthy sexual appetite and they started taking a medication and it went away, then, and that's a problem for them, they see that as a, unacceptable side effect, then it's important to encourage them to advocate with their physician. Um, SSRIs, your typical antidepressants, are long known for impairing sexual desire, which, and, and that can be enhanced in elderly folks. The most common causes for male erectile dysfunction are vascular diseases, Encourage them to stay active, stay healthy, keep their blood pressure under control in order to reduce the chances of erectile dysfunction issues. But as we get older, our arteries and stuff just naturally stiffen a little bit. So we really want to work against that aging process as much as possible. Remember that age is not a barrier to sexually transmitted diseases, so some people may need to be educated. You may be working with somebody who was married for 50 years, and, you know, they married their high school sweetheart, married for 50 years, their spouse passes away, and then suddenly they are dating again, and they may not be aware of all the sexually transmitted diseases out there. In women, lack of emotional well-being and a sense of intimacy during sexual intercourse can lead to reduced sexual interest. As we get older, doesn't mean we don't still need to have that sense of intimacy and connection in our, in our interactions. I told you we would talk about malnutrition. The causes of malnutrition can stem from a whole list of things. Other health problems. If somebody is having, uh, m my mother, for example, when the cancer spread to her stomach, she couldn't eat. It hurt too much to eat. So cancer can be a cause of malnutrition. Um, there are a lot of different health issues that a doctor would need to, to diagnose. If somebody is malnourished, first thing we want to do is get a checkup. Let's see if there's anything physiological causing this. Bariatric surgery. Most older folks don't have bariatric surgery then, but if they had bariatric surgery when they were younger, that the side effects from that do not go away. So they may not be getting all of the nutrients that a person who hadn't had that surgery would because it's bypassing significant portions of the digestive tract. Seniors suffering from dementia may forget to eat. If the person has depression, they may just not feel like eating. They may not be motivated to eat. If they have alcoholism, 
they may be eating some, they may be eating a lot, but they also may be malnourished. You can be overweight and malnourished. Alcohol affects the absorption of a whole host of vitamins and minerals. So if they are heavy drinkers, even if they are not technically alcoholics or um, they don't technically meet the criteria for substance use disorder, heavy alcohol use can contribute to malnutrition. If the person has dietary restrictions for other health conditions, for whatever reason, it can contribute to malnutrition. Um, reduced social contact. Sometimes when people are not interacting with one another, if they are a widower living by themselves or, um, you know, after my, after my mother passed away, my stepfather doesn't cook. He struggles to do uh, microwave dishes and, and things like that or um, TV dinners. So this reduced social contact, one of the things we were most concerned about with him was him eating and making sure he was staying, staying nourished and remembering to eat because not only did he have reduced social contact, he also had, you know, extreme depression and bereavement and everything else going on. Limited income. Healthy food's expensive. We want to make sure that elders have access to healthy foods out there. And there's a lot of gardeners out there, um, like myself, who we overplant. Uh, we plant enough for us, the critters, and half the neighborhood. So if you have a coalition in your community that is willing to accept fresh fruits, like I have, I must have 200 butternut squash sitting on, on racks drying right now. And there's no way we'll eat 200 butternut squash. So I can donate those to our local food pantry and they can hand those out. A lot of gardeners don't know about this stuff though. So if community agencies actively solicit gardeners to donate their excess fresh food that's one way and you know your meals on wheels programs whomever can do this reduced mobility can affect people because they have difficulty maybe getting out of the bed and getting into the kitchen to make something they may have difficulty standing on their feet long enough to make something or they may have difficulty getting to the grocery store to get the food to make something. Mobility comes in all shapes and sizes. We need to understand what this person's capabilities are to make sure that we can scaffold, you know, provide enough resources to meet them where they, where they are. And another one that we don't think about a lot is dental problems. As people age, you know, well, even when you're younger, you can get cavities and, and and problems like that as people age if they start getting cavities they may not be able to afford dental insurance or den dental care which may lead to them not getting treatment and developing all kinds of mouth related problems and abscesses and stuff but you know think about how uncomfortable it is to eat when you have a when you have a cavity making sure that they're able to access that. And there are a lot of resources. If you contact United Way Information and Referral or the local area agency on aging, um, you can often find resources for free and or low-cost dental care for elderly patients. As I said earlier, sleep needs do not decrease with age, which I was really hoping it would, but it doesn't. So I'm still going to need my, uh, you know, eight to nine hours. Short and long sleep duration groups have increased prevalence of mental health issues. People who don't get enough sleep, they're only getting a few hours, have a 66% correlation with depression. 66% of them have depression. People who sleep too long, you know, they're sleeping 10, 11, 12, 15 hours, 26% of them have depression. Just because you need more sleep doesn't necessarily mean you're depressed. But, you know, it can be an indicator. You know, being depressed can make you want to sleep more or and or sleeping more or sleeping less can throw your circadian rhythms out of whack, which can make it more difficult to sleep, which can increase or cause depression. 
Poor quality, insufficient sleep is associated with poor physical functioning and cardiovascular issues, which are associated with increased risk of falls, increased risk of stroke, and increased risk of dementia. With aging, I said you don't need any less sleep, but with aging, slow wave sleep or your deep sleep is expected along with, or less slow wave sleep is expected, along with more awakenings and a tendency towards earlier sleep times. So our clock switches back a little bit, but that doesn't mean we don't need as much. And with, I go to sleep right now at 7.30 and I get up at, at uh, 4 o'clock, so I can only imagine I'll be going to sleep at 2 in the afternoon when I get older. Causes of sleep problems, bladder control, that's the most common one that we think of. And it can be for women and for men, but it tends to be more problematic or more prominent in, in men, especially if they start having prostate problems. Have that evaluated by a urologist, and there are interventions that they can use, you know, and you can go online and read all about them, you know, not drinking more than eight ounces of fluid after, you know, 4 p.m. and you know, making sure you empty your bladder thoroughly before you go to bed. There are different things that they can do to help. But it is important that they're able to get a good night's sleep most nights. Neurological conditions like restless leg syndrome can cause sleep problems. It's another one that has to be evaluated by an MD. But if the person tells you that they are thrashing and you know, describing restless leg syndrome or describing something that seems neurological, definitely get it evaluated. Lung diseases such as asthma and COPD can make it hard to breathe. It in can increase the rate of sleep apnea, and which will wake you up from your sleep. It can make it harder for you to get quality sleep. Chronic pain, as we talked about, can cause, cause you not to get good enough sleep. Anemia. This is a new one. Anemia has been implicated in sleep problems, especially in elderly people, as has gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, gastric reflux. As we get older, people tend to develop a propensity or more of a propensity to gastric reflux um, <clears throat> and may have more GI kind of problems. One thing to remember or pay attention to is that rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder often represents the earliest sign of a Lewy body dementia. Well, what does that mean? Well, Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's are kind of related, but it's important that if somebody has rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, that they get referred to a neurologist toot sweet. In rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, People act out vivid, often unpleasant dreams with vocal sounds and sudden, often violent arm and leg movements during their REM sleep. Now, I think most of us have been in REM sleep at, or some stage of sleep at some point or another and like jerked ourselves awake, but this is something that's ongoing. It's not just it happens once every three years. Uh, if that that is seen or if your client complains of waking up and being in a full sweat and feeling like they ran a marathon, a sleep study might be in order. Social support serves major functions, including emotional support, well, go figure, informational support, providing advice and guidance on what to do. Um, when my grandmother was still living in, in her house. You know, she needed a lot of informational support. When something would break with the house, she would call my uncle and tell him what was going on, and he would tell her what to do. And so she needed that advice and guidance about, you know, who do I call, how much should it cost, what am I looking at here? And instrumental support is also a... a function of social support. And this is providing rides, assisting with housekeeping, assisting with cleaning, anything that the person may not be able to do for themselves anymore is important, is an important function of social support. Adequate social support is associated with redu reduced risk of mental illnesses, physical illnesses, and mortality, which I said we would talk briefly about retirement blues. 
not everybody waits till they're 65 to retire, which is why I said some of this stuff can start earlier if you have somebody who is a, an early retiree. When we leave our job, when we retire and we back away from seeing those people we used to see eight or 10 hours a day, you know, 200 days a year to not seeing them at all, that's, that's a loss. When you're not in that same routine anymore and you have to find a new normal, that's an adjustment. And for people who do retire, they may not feel a sense of meaning anymore. You know, going to work gave them a sense of meaning and they don't have that. There's a lot of stuff that psychological, um, psychosocial issues that come up with retirement. We do want to make sure that we don't minimize that. Some people say, well, if the person can't get out, if they've got low mobility or, you know, their kids live across country, just get them an iPad. Well, that only helps a little bit. Technology-based interventions to reduce social isolation have been found to have a moderate but short-term impact on reducing isolation. It helps the first couple of times. It's like, oh, oh boy, I'm getting to chat on the iPad with, <clears throat> with my grandkids. But then after the first couple of times, they hang up and sometimes they even feel more lonely. They're just like, oh, well, now I'm all by myself again. Social support interventions need to focus on helping the person connect with the outside world, the tangible outside world. Encourage them to gain social support in their local area. It can be neighbors. It can be at a um, senior center, wherever it is. They found that it's super important <clears throat> for people, not just older adults, to engage in meaningful activities every single day. And, or almost every single day, you know, sometimes we want to take one Saturday off here and there and just binge watch Netflix or something. That's cool. But for the most part, you want to engage in something meaningful every day. And that helps people continue with the sense of purpose and direction. And social support interventions should also focus on boosting self-confidence. As people get older, as I said, some feel like they're a burden. Some feel like, you know, they've lost a step. Some feel like they don't have anything to contribute because they can't do the things they used to. We want to encourage self-confidence in older adults, focusing on the knowledge they do have and what they can contribute uh, to conversations, to situations, and to other people's lives. There are foster grandparent programs that are out there where Older adults can be foster grandparents for kids who may not have grandparents that are, that are local or for high-risk youth. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, volunteer activities that older adults can participate in if they want to. And significant others. We've talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to hit on it one more time. And this is different from social support. And we need to remember that the significant others of our clients are also going through their own adjustment as, you know, if, if a parent has to move in with you, how does that affect that person's life? Or that family's life, you know, all of a sudden grandma's living there. Or if the older adult has to go to a, an assisted living facility. Not only do we need to look at how does that impact that older adult, but also how does that impact the social support system and the significant others. I know um, my mom and, and my uncle just felt awful. And were devastated when my grandmother had to go to assisted living because she really did not want to go. However, she was just not safe to live by herself anymore. And there was nobody around her. There was nobody local who could care for her um, in the way that she needed because she really needed like 24-7 supervision. It was really important for my mom and my uncle to get the support from the 
staff at the assisted living facility, assuring them that they were doing the right thing and helping them see how my grandmother, once she got there, actually flourished uh, in, in that setting when she was able, they had to go to, to meals unless they had a medical reason not to. So she was kind of being forced to engage in social activity, but it really brought her spunk out again. And she was vivacious for the first time in probably 10 years, which was really awesome. Significant others are also going to ha have financial concerns. You know, if they're paying for their, their parent or their loved one to be in an assisted living facility, you know, that may put a financial strain on the significant others that may need to be addressed. So not only they, they don't feel resentful and angry and stressed out, but also so the older adult can stay in that facility once they're there and have made their connections. Life satisfaction is the final aspect that we want to consider. And it's the self-evaluation of one's life as a whole and is influenced by socioeconomic, health, and environmental factors. Life dissatisfaction is associated with obesity and risky health behaviors, such as smoking, physical acti inactivity, and heavy drinking, all which increase the risk of dementia. How do we increase life satisfaction? Help people engage in meaningful activities. Help them process their life and see all the wonderful things that they did. Help them figure out if there are still things on their to-do list, if there's still things that for them to feel like they've, you know, gotten everything accomplished that they want to, wanted to, that they still need to do. They may need to start figuring out if it's something they can accomplish and if so, how to do it. So they have that sense of satisfaction. They're not holding on to a lot of regrets. One of the things you can do, and it's kind of like acceptance and commitment therapy when we ask people, you know, what does a rich and meaningful life look like to you? What does life satisfaction look like to you? You know, if you're going to be satisfied with your life, if you can be content with where you are and what you've done and all that kind of stuff, what things have you done that contributed to that? And, you know, is there anything else that you still have outstanding that you want to do? Cultural differences impacting treatment between those of us who are younger and older adults. Uh, different conceptualization of the problem. And this is true whether you're working with somebody who was born in 1930 or, you know, 50 years from now when you're working with somebody who was born in 2010. Because of the generational differences in perceptions of issues, there may be different conceptualizations of the problem. We need to understand what the patient feels is the problem, what they think is causing the problem, if they even see it as a problem, and what they think would be the most effective ways to address that problem. They may have a different idea of appropriate interventions. You know, you may see a person with depression and think, well, you know, 10 weeks of counseling would do wonders, and they're really looking for an antidepressant. You're going to have to get on the same bandwagon. On the opposite side of it, you know, my grandmother um, was prescribed some benzodiazepines for as needed. She refused to take them because she didn't think that was appropriate and she didn't want to become a drug addict. And we were like, Grandma, you're 87. I don't think you're going to have to worry about that at this point. But she was terrified of taking medications. That's okay. You know, so we needed to figure out different ways to help her address her anxiety. And the reason I bring up my, my grandparents and my, you know, stepfather and stuff so much is because obviously I don't have to worry about HIPAA issues with them, and I know they wouldn't mind, um, or they don't mind. So uh, anyway, that's not just a pick on them, but uh, it makes it easier from a liability standpoint. Anyhow, other cultural differences. They may be suspicious of strangers. Where, when they grew up, it may be a keep it in the family. You don't share your business. On the other end of it, they may also have 
or I guess it's not a different end, it's just a different point. They may also have white coat syndrome where the doctor, whether it's their therapist or the nurse or whomever, their, their treating practitioner is seen as the be all end all expert. And if they say this is what needs to happen, then this is what needs to happen. It doesn't matter what I think. And it's important to make sure that everybody, not just older adults, everybody recognizes the fact that they are the expert on themselves. So if they hear something from the doctor and they're like, you know, that I'm not thinking that's exactly it, that they can advocate for themselves and that they understand that their uh, treating practitioner should be receptive to that and explain it or you know, consider the other options. Some people, older adults, may have different expressions of distress. A lot of times there's more somatization and more lethargy and sleeping um, when we talk about depression and, and mood disorders. And older adults may have lim access to much more limited resources in terms of access to medication, access to different therapies, ability to get to different doctor's appointments. We need to take all that into consideration when we're figuring out how to develop this comprehensive treatment plan. Older people with mental illnesses, particularly depression or dementia, may take longer to respond to treatment. We need to, you know, slow down a little bit. Interactions between medication and comorbid physical illnesses and the treatment of those illnesses are also common. It's important to address coexistent physical and mental health issues in order to help the person achieve their highest quality of life. And social engagement, physical activity, control of diabetes and hypertension, prevention of depression, and developing a sense of life satisfaction are all associated with positive health outcomes and a reduced risk of dep depression and dementia. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes by just using the promo code CEU when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. If this podcast helps you help your clients or yourself, please support us by purchasing your CEUs at allceus.com or getting your agency to sponsor an episode. A direct link to the on-demand CEUs for this podcast is at allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. That's allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. To sponsor an episode of Counselor Toolbox and reach over 50,000 clinicians per week, go to allceus.com slash sponsor. Thank you.